Chapter 19 Top was up with the larks and the dogs. The dogs were doing a lot of barking and the farmers who owned these dogs were adding to the canine cacophony with loud barks of their own and they weren't smiling. Cornelius, upon whom Tup had curled himself up for the night, awoke in some confusion. He went immediately for the tried and tested where am I? What's going on? routine with the addition of get off me top and shut those dogs up. What is happening? he continued when his senses had got themselves all back together. Dogs are barking, said Tup informatively. But why are they barking? You have me on that, I'm afraid. I could tell you why pigs grunt, but I don't know if that would be helpful right now. Cornelius crawled over to the open door of the happy bus and gazed out. The sun was shining bravely, but it shone down upon a scene which was sadly lacking in the rural bliss department. Three fierce-looking red-faced men in tweedy caps wax jackets, hardy trues and wellington boots were remonstrating with Bourne and Bollocks. Louise and Candy stood with their backs to the bus. The children clung to them fearfully. There were dogs all around, big dogs and claws. What's happening? called Cornelius. Bagger off, boy! a tweed capper called back. Oh, said Cornelius. I think I'll get the picture. Stay inside, called Bollocks. You're not involved in this. On the contrary, Cornelius climbed to his feet and climbed down from the bus. You stay here, he told Tup. Those are very big dogs. You have my moral support, called Tup. Use it as you think fit. Nah, said Cornelius, smiling all around. A big fat tweed cap and nudged a similarly proportioned compatriot in the padded rib area. Lend your new scarecrow you ordered for your top field, Harry. I see. Cornelius continued to smile. Is there some problem here? Not for us, boy, but plenty for you if you don't get your shit heap and your scabby mates off my land. Shit heap and scabby mates. Cornelius raised an eyebrow. Two large black dogs began to sniff around his slender ankles. Ain't much on the bone for you fellas, the farmer told them. Go back in the bus, said Bollocks. It's okay. Cornelius raised a calming hand. Would you kindly call your dogs to heal? He asked the farmer. They're frightening women and children. That isn't right. Oh, we got a right one, have we? The farmer laughed hideously and fixed Cornelius with a bitter stare. Get your scum off my land. We were leaving anyway, said Bollocks, ushering Louise, Candy and the children back into the bus. Come on, Cornelius, let's go. We're not going anywhere yet, the tall boy replied, when all were safely on board. We haven't had our breakfast. One of the farmer's colleagues rolled some unspeakable phlegm around in his mouth and spat it at Cornelius. There's your breakfast, he said with a sneer. And then Top appeared in the bus doorway. Did someone say breakfast? he asked. What? The spitter of phlegm gaped at Tup. It's a bleeding dwarf. Got snow white in there, have you? That's enough, said Cornelius, who was no longer smiling. You may spit at me if you choose, but you will not insult my friend. He is immune to such crassness, but I find it extremely offensive. Would you care to apologise? Would you care for me to set my dogs on you? The farmer asked. Cornelius reached down and stroked the neck of the pit bull that was sniffing around his ankles. It looked up at him and lolled its tongue. Nice boy, said Cornelius Murphy. Seize him, Prince, ordered the farmer. Prince, however, seemed disinclined to do any seizing. He snuggled against the Murphy leg. Cornelius bent down and took the dog's head gently between his hands. He's very good with animals, Tup whispered to Bollocks. Seize him, Prince, went the farmer. Cornelius smelt the dog's breath. Prince hasn't eaten since yesterday afternoon, he informed the now fuming farmer, and then it was on bad meat. Now that isn't right, is it? I don't feed bad meat to my dogs. The farmer took a step forward, but Cornelius ignored him. He had now turned his attention to the fellow who made the scarecrow remark. The tall boy drew a deep breath through his nose. Still poisoning badges, he said, 
and he said it quietly, because the dogs were no longer barking. They were sniffing silently about Prince, the leader of the pack, and Prince was licking the tall boy's hand. Badgers? The fat fellow made a face of alarm. What do you mean? You tell him. Cornelius told the last of the three. You were with him. You supplied the poison. Chemicals are really your thing, aren't they? Those concoctions you pump into your cattle will get you into trouble one day. Three mouths hung open. There was a bit of an unholy silence. Then, what, 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 went the farmer's three. And, seize him, Prince, went up the cry once more. But Prince remained disinclined. Perhaps Prince would prefer Willow to the sheep's heads you feed him, Cornelius suggested. Now, just you see her here. No, said Cornelius. You see here. I have no axe to grind with you people, although I think what you do is obscene. It is actually none of my business, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll forget all about informing the authorities, he paused. If, said the big fat farmer, if you apologise nicely and furnish us all with a bit of breakfast. How does that sound? Cornelius had never smelt pure hatred before, and he didn't like the smell of it one little bit. The farmers stared at Cornelius, and Cornelius stared back at the farmers. And I think, as a gesture of goodwill, you might raise Tubby for a good share of this year's take to 50%, was the tall boy's closing shot. They all tucked into the wholesome fare the farmer's wife delivered. How did you know all about that stuff? Bollocks asked. Cornelius tapped his aquiline proboscis. Good clean air and farmers who never change their jackets. Mind you, I took a chance on the chemicals. A stunk of cattle and hormones and stuff. I just put two and two together, in being so fat and all. Brilliant! Bollocks little fried eggs on the tall boy's plate. If your kids hadn't been there, I'd have punched their lights out. The dogs would have had you. Cornelius got stuck into his breakfast. How did you do that with the dogs? Calm them down and everything. That was brilliant also. Dogs don't hate, said Cornelius between mouthfuls. Only people hate. People think they can train dogs to hate, but they can't. The animals don't understand the concept. Dogs do whatever their masters tell them, for love. Animals do respond to love. I just showed a little love. There was no trick there. That's bollocks, said bollocks. Of course it is, Cornelius replied. Actually, I'm in possession of a talisman of protection that has been in my family for 23 generations. He grinned through his toast. That's more like it. Bollocks loaded up a plate for himself. I knew there was a logical explanation. Brilliant. You're quite brilliant, Cornelius. He's the stuff of epics, said Tup. I'd like to bear your children, said Louise. Me too, said Candy. Cornelius grinned a bigger grin than ever. If I can square it with your husbands, I should be honoured to oblige, said he. The sun, which had so recently risen upon Cornelius, Top and the fork of the happy bus, rose also upon Inspector Horvis. The man from the yard lay prone upon the garret floor, smelling strongly of ether and a dire cocktail of illegal substances. The great detective, whose greatness had yet to be proved to many minds, had just the two days left to solve the crime of the century. That crime of crimes, which as yet possessed the substance of a ghost's fart in a forced hen gale. Just two days left, before redundancy and goodbye, Mr. Horvis. No knighthood, just goodbye. The inspector dragged himself into the vertical plane. I will survive, he told his washbasin. I will triumph, he informed his unmade bed. I will succeed, he shouted to the four grey walls. Thump, 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 went the broom handle on the ceiling below. Other people were waking up on this fine and sunny morning, and some in the strangest of places. Mickey Minns opened his eyes and stared at the ceiling. Where am I? he asked. His wife rolled over and smacked him right in the face. Get back in your bloody wardrobe, she told him. Anna Gotting woke up. She stumbled from her bed and bashed her fist on the wall. Keep it down in there, she shouted. Polly Gotting tried to keep it down, 
but taking tea with the parson can get pretty loud. Sorry, said Prince Charles. Was one making too much noise? You might cut out the train whistles, but other than that, you're doing fine. This is much more fun than polo, said the prince. I wouldn't know about that, Polly replied. I've never read any of Jilly Cooper's books. Just that, just that, went the prince. I'm sorry. Tommy Cooper, he used to say, just that. I don't think I quite understand. It's a sort of joke thing, the prince explained. When you said Jilly Cooper, I pretended that I thought you said Tommy Cooper. So I went, just like that, in a zany, goonish, madcap kind of a way. Why? Polly asked. Because you make me so happy, the prince replied.